Welcome to our podcast. I'm Jeff Pelletier. The purpose of our podcast is a simple question. Why is Israel important? Over the next many episodes, my partner Neil Johnson and I will seek to answer this question. There are just barely over 14 million descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the world today, and about five and a half million of them live in Israel. The rest are scattered across and among the nations. For the sake of our podcast, Israel is both a country and a people. So, Neil, here we are in Genesis 19. Our focus has been on Abraham in both 17 and 18, but Lot becomes the focus for Abraham. So we're talking about Abraham, but Lot is the focus for Abraham. Now, folks, you can get a lot of the background on this journey by listening to episodes 6 through 12. So if we leave some stuff out, uh, don't don't send us a hate mail telling us uh, we didn't know what we were talking about. We do, because if you listen to 6 through 12, you'll get the whole rest of the picture. But I'd like to kind of summarize, Neil, uh, the relationship... Uh, uh, their relationship uh, in this in this uh, podcast before we get into chapter 19. So Abraham is giving us a lesson that many people miss. Correct in in this in the text. Right. So 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 we see a, we see Lot beginning in Genesis chapter 13, and then in 14, 18, and 19 he's present in the in the text. So but Lot is a presence in, in Abraham's life. Yeah, a bigger in, in, right. in the text is particularly important. Right. So early in in Abram's Abram's journey in chapter eleven, Abram's dad, in chapter eleven, Terah, took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, who was Abraham's or Abram's uh, nephew, uh, Abram's wife Sarai, and landed in Haran, which today is Turkey. Right. 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 Mm-hmm. right? Okay. So. Uh, in chapter 12, uh, God tells Abraham to go, or Abram, to go to a place he will show him, and he gives Abram a good reason to go when he tells him that he will make him uh, a great nation or a great people, and that the whole earth will be blessed, right, by, right. These, by these people. And Abraham takes Lot, his nephew, with him. God doesn't tell him to take Lot. Right. He takes him with him. Right. Right? So that's another indicator, right? So in chapter 13, we see Lot benefited financially from being with Abram, right? Because Abram and Lot had acquired big herds and wealth and gold and silver, and they were consuming more than the land they were on could support together. So Abram recommends that they split up, and he gives Lot the option of which way to go. Right. And he'll go wherever Lot doesn't go. Right. So that's another indicator, right? So in chapter 13, we start to see who Lot is personally, as a man. We start to see who he is. Uh, He sets his sights on the plain where Sodom and Gomorrah are, and he heads in that direction, right? right? Camping near Sodom. Near Sodom, right? And... um, so here we we got a, we got a sense of what is attractive to Lot, right? Right. Yeah. Right. We've got his basic core personality yeah. already. Yeah, we figured it out, right? Uh, and and in chapter thirteen, uh, also we start to see who Lot is. He sets his sights on the plain where Sodom and Gomorrah are, and he heads in that direction. As I said, camping near Sodom. So Neil, you called him a no goodnik. Right. Early on in, in our chapter 12 or 13 or 14 or 15, I forget where it was. But tell, tell us about this young man. Well, throughout these chapters, whatever chapter he's mentioned, he never comes across, no matter how you twist it or turn it, as a very good person. Mm-hmm. Uh, he is uh, very uh, topsy-turvy at best. He is, you could say, uh, two-faced, very, maybe? two-faced, two-faced and faced. very base yeah. at worst. Yeah. And as you said, Jeff, just as we can glean something about Lot, and, Lot, and we do mm-hmm. from all of these things, also Abraham, just by the very fact that Abraham gave him the choice Lot couldn't resist going to the Fertile Plain. Mm -hmm. He took it immediately. But again, Abraham is, the whole picture here is to compare Abraham with 
Lot. That's what these chapters are about because Abraham is a type and Lot is a type. They are types, that's correct. So I, I kind of see uh, the guy, uh, there was an old TV show back right. in the day called Leave it to Beaver, right? right. And it's still playing on, on cable somewhere. And and uh, there was this character on Leave it to Beaver called Eddie Haskell. Oh, yes. Right? And Eddie Haskell <laughs> uh, was really nice to people in authority, oh, right? Yeah. Like parents, like uh, parents or, or teachers oh, or the yes. principal of the school or his employer, his boss. Oh, yeah. Very nice to them. But... When he wasn't uh, trying to make a good impression on people that were in authority, he was a schmuck. Oh, yeah. 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 And, and so uh, he's not a very good guy at all. You got to and, see his real nature. Yeah, his real nature. And I think Lot's kind of like him. He absolutely is uh, just exactly in that regard. So, That's exactly so I have a, right. I have a couple clips I want to play oh, okay. about Eddie Haskell, you know, oh. Eddie, the character <laughs> of Eddie Haskell, to show these two different huh. faces huh. Of, of Eddie Haskell. Because this will give you an idea of what Lot was like. No recording of Lot, just Eddie. Okay, just, just well, Eddie. that's close enough. Yeah. yeah. Good evening, Mr. Cleaver. Oh, hello, Eddie. Uh, I wonder if I might speak to Wally. We had a tentative engagement for this evening. Uh, that means it's not exactly definite. <laughs> Thank you, Eddie. Yeah. Wally's upstairs. He's been trying on his lifeguard out there. Uh, lifeguard? Is Wally really going to be a lifeguard? Coach Driscoll recommended him for the job. I suppose the fact that he'd lettered three sports had something to do with it. Uh, yes, sir. Athletics are fine, Mr. Cleaver. Of course, my father prefers me to develop in a normal manner. Uh, is it all right if I go up and speak to Wally, Mr. Cleaver? You go right ahead, son. <laughs> He looks like a real lifeguard, doesn't he, Eddie? Sure he does. But I get your angle, Wally. I can see those girls now. Oh, save me. Save me, Mr. Lifeguard. I am drowning. Glub, glub, glub. Cut it out, will you, Eddie? I'll take a poke at you. Go ahead, Wally. Hit him. Take it easy, Tarzan. You'll bend your muscles. <laughs> hey, you want to go to the movies tonight? Well, what's plan? Who cares? It's Friday night. <laughs> nah, I better get to bed early. I gotta get up and take the bus up to the lake in the morning. I'm going with two other guys that are gonna be lifeguards. Okay, you get your beauty rest, champ. <laughs> okay, okay, that was pretty good. So, so Abraham uh, then went towards the promised land that God showed him, and Lot went towards the midway at the carnival. Yeah, that's pretty much right? it. Which is Sodom and Gomorrah and the five dun, cities. Dun, on, dun, on, dun, dun, on the, yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly yeah. Hey, get, come yeah. Get right up. Right. Come right up. Yeah, yeah exactly. you don't care where I go, yeah. I'll, I'll take the best. Yeah, see the lady with the snake head. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she walks, she so, talks. So yeah. in chapter 14, mm -hmm. we see that Lot gets himself in trouble. Right. And Abram comes to his rescue. Right. The no good Nick. Absolutely. He comes to his rescue. And he even fights a battle he for him, a war. Yeah, he comes to his battle immediately. He comes yeah. to his, his aid immediately. And he wins the battle right. and rescues him. Right. And Lot, even though he's saved by his uncle, stays in Sodom. Yeah, he returns happily. What's up? Yeah. You know, right? Right. So that tells you more about the guy, right? Well, like you say, I'm sure he was, I'm Mrs. Cleaver, I yeah. thank you so much, but I'm heading back now. Yeah, you know. Abraham still loves Lot. Very Even much. though he's acting this way, right? That's exactly right. In fact, right. When, when God comes to visit Abraham in chapter 18, which we just talked about the last time, and he, he implies the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah or the, and the five cities are on the agenda, right? Yeah. And Abram, Abraham immediately starts to negotiate with God about saving some of the people. Abraham asks God, if there's 50 righteous people, will you not? And God says, no, I won't. He said, if there's 45, will you not destroy? Yeah, I said 45. How about 40? How about 30? And then he gets all the way down to 20, and God still agrees, and he gets to 10. Right. And God says, I will not destroy it if there are 10 righteous people. Well, 10 just happens to be the number of people in Lot's family. Yeah, it sure seems from the text you can definitely yeah. get that he has at least 10 yeah. people. 
So Abraham knows what he's doing. He's got a lot in his head. He's got a lot in his heart. Right. He wants to save him. Oh, absolutely. It's amazing. Yeah. He absolutely. will not give up on this guy. No, no. It's amazing. So we can see here that Abraham cares for Lot, and that based on the based on the Eddie Haskell behavior, it seems that Eddie or Lot does not deserve it. Right. But Abraham loves him anyway. And these are crucial uh, little snippets mm-hmm. that we as uh, believers who put credence mm-hmm. and authority into the documents, mm-hmm. the text, mm-hmm. should glean from this. Abraham here is very much a, a foreshadowing, a type mm-hmm. of Messiah. Yeah. And and uh, Eddie slash Lot yeah, exactly. is really, quite frankly, the rest of us. Yep, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so so it's it's interesting to me that, you know, we're learning... We're, you know, so Abraham is the father of many nations. We're going to learn about this. Abraham is the father of Israel, the father of Isaac, right? And he's he's kind of saying to the nation as well, right? The nation of Israel and all those who come from Abraham, this is how you do it. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, there there is the primary uh, uh, progeny of uh, Abraham, the Jews. Mm-hmm. The Lord throughout the Bible, which is the history book of the Jews to bring salvation to the world, uh, set them apart. But we always have to remember that even though we see those types and those pictures, remember that Israel is also called God's firstborn, mm-hmm. his firstborn son. Which, impl- which indicates that there are other, other. children. Yes. But to, to be a disobedient or disenfranchised or angry adopted child at your adoptive parents, uh, you know, Jeff, I always think to myself, how would you feel if you spent uh, money, time, and effort to adopt a child that was maybe in another land that was very uh, downtrodden? you know, mm-hmm. uh, in very dire circumstances. Mm-hmm. But once you got them, they were very much uh, arrogant and they be, uh, treated the, the, the natural children of, of the family poorly and, and diminished all they said or did or accomplished. Uh, that's wrong behavior. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And so uh, Ishmael right. is a son of Abraham, right? Right. Yes, he is. Okay. Uh, he loved his son, Ishmael. Dearly. Right? Ishmael was circumcised. 13 years old. Right, 13 years old. So he's in the covenant. He's in the covenant. Right? All of the nations that came out of Ishmael are in the covenant. Right. Right? And, I mean, if, if you just stop and think about it, and then afterwards we're going to find out a little bit down the road that there are other nations That's right. and peoples that come from Abraham, and they're all part of the covenant. Yes, indeed. So, so we have a lot more in common than we realize as a as a whole world right. because the world came out from this group. That's his exactly right? right. All of yeah. the descendants of everybody. I I would think so. Yeah. And uh, you know, we hear about 6 degrees of separation mm-hmm. in our day how mm-hmm. everybody's attached within 6 degrees. So certainly it seems that's the case, but to the main point that we don't want to lose is that God had a plan and a reason and a way and that was to create, if you will, a defined people group through Abraham, then through Isaac, then through Jacob and the 12 tribes to bring salvation and the knowledge of God to the world. To the world. And right. unfortunately, yeah. a great part of yeah. Christianity, at least, yeah. and of course, that's who we're concerned about, those who put uh, credence in the documents, sure. uh, have treated Israel with anything but the respect and the tenderness that they are commanded to do. Remember, we're commanded to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We're commanded Amen. to lift them up daily before Amen. the Lord. Lord. Amen. And uh, we haven't done that. Well, and we know that because salvation comes from the Jews. Right. That's where it comes from. Right. And so we, we ought, it just makes sense that we would be honorable and that we would be uh, uh, valuing them. And right. we would, we would uh, I mean, Yeshua. Right, exactly. You know, I mean, it, it, it's... So salvation comes from the Jews. It doesn't, it doesn't come from the Edomites. That's it exactly comes from the right. Jews. It comes from the Jews. <laughs> and we are commanded in Isaiah to, to lift them up to the Lord till he makes Israel a praise in the earth. And we're commanded yeah. in the Psalms to yeah. pray for the peace yeah. of Jerusalem. Yeah, that's right. And I think you and I have talked about this before. It's a quick digression. But who would have a problem paying, 
praying for the peace of Jerusalem as yeah. a believer, first of all. As a believer, right. And what yeah. is the peace of yeah. Jerusalem? Yeah. Well, if you're praying for the peace of Jerusalem, that yeah. would be Yeshua ultimately. Yeah, right. But if there's peace in Jerusalem, there's peace in the world. Mm-hmm. Because we also read throughout Scripture that the law, the Torah, the instruction, or God's radiant grace will come forth from Jerusalem. And, and the, uh, at the end, speak, you know, jumping, leaping forward, leaping at the forward. end, the new Jerusalem. The comes, new Jerusalem, Comes yeah. down. Right, right. From Ultimately. Heaven. Right. Yeah. So, it's, I mean, it's, like, it's never out of the picture. It's never out of the picture, so, right. So, yeah, it's interesting. Okay, what we're trying to do, folks, in this podcast is explain why that's important. Explain why the new Jerusalem comes down at the end. We could just talk about that, but that's not... We're talking about how it got there, why it's important, and why we should... Why we should what Neil just said, everything Neil just said, why we should do that. So we're going we're gonna to look at uh, chapter 19, but before we do that, we're going to look at the last two verses of chapter 18, because it kind of uh, it kind of sets the stage for what happens in the first verse of 19. Yeah, it absolutely does. So verse 21, it says, I... And he's talking, this is Yahweh speaking, the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, which is Yahweh. I, Yahweh, will go down and see if they have done entirely according to its outcry, which has come to me, and if not, then I will know. So he's talking about Sodom and Gomorrah and the five cities in the plain, right? So then the men that are with, uh, the three men that came to visit Abraham in chapter uh, 18, uh, two of them turn away. From there, and they went towards Sodom while Abraham was still standing before Yahweh. Right. So the verse, first verse in, in 19 says, Now the two angels came to Sodom. Wait, what? First time. What? Yeah. What? Exactly. Yeah. The two angels came to Sodom in the evening as Lot was sitting at the gate of Sodom. Then Lot saw them and he rose to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. So Eddie Haskell emerges right away. He sees the two angels, and he gets it. He knows that somebody important has just shown up. And Lot, you know, of course, is is at the gate, so that means he has got a title of some kind of official function at the gate, and he's like the toll taker or the bridge keeper or whatever the heck it is. We don't know. But he's standing at the gate of the city, and uh, he's, you know, he, he's, he's checking people in or whatever he's doing, and uh, he immediately senses... Uh, Eddie Haskell does. I mean, lot that uh, that these are important people, and he bows down. And he makes a big deal uh, about who they are right away. Right, right, yeah. And and it is important, as we stressed last time, that uh, we we keep going variously between Yahweh, man, and now we have angels introduced into this picture, mm-hmm. and Yahweh still stayed with. Abraham, while Abraham negotiated with him about the fate of the Sodom area. Yep. And right away, remember these chapter headings are strictly man-made conventions for our benefit Correct. to be able to read them. Now, in that same sequence of events, it says, the two who left, now it calls them angels. Mm-hmm. And subsequently, it will call them uh, men again, and of course later we'll probably talk about they do things and say things as if they are the Lord. You can't, uh, it, yeah, you can't ignore the uh, extracurricular activity they engage in in terms of uh, power and so forth uh, at the end there. Yeah. So in, in verse two, it's you know Lot, Lot continues with his um, uh, blowing smoke. He says, "Now behold, my lords, please turn aside into your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet." And then you may rise early and go on your way. And, and they said, no, we will spend the night here in the square. But Lot goes, no, 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 no. I insist strongly. So they turned aside to him uh, and entered his house. And he prepared a feast for them. And he bra- baked unleavened bread and they ate. So he's really putting, as they used to say, the dog on here. Right. He's really laying out the red carpet because he wants to make a good impression because he knows these people are important. Yeah. He may not know what they're about, but he knows they're important, and he wants to make sure that he gets his. That's right, yeah. That, and he also knows that something, whether he observed them in the way that we know Abraham did when he saw them, mm-hmm. he knows something's up, if nothing else, by the sheer fact that nobody, yeah. I mean, you can read other uh, yeah. references to Sodom outside of the Bible, and mm. nobody entered that city mm. unscathed, mm. and nobody surely spent the night, and these folks have no fear. So something was mm. contagious. Mm. But again, uh, Eddie, Lot, our, our friend, 
he also invites them to leave first thing in the morning. In the here. morning. So he's yeah. he's showing his character here. Yeah. So he yep. did something kind of good. But so so in verse four, yeah, uh, it says before they lay down for the evening, before they went to sleep, the men of the city, the right. men of the city, the men of Sodom, surrounded the house, and they were young and old, and all people. They were uh, consisted of all the all the people. From every quarter of the city, so rich, poor, government, civilian, all kinds of people showed up at the city, and they say to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may have relations with them. Correct. So let's be honest. Well, and we're talking about homosexuality, which should pretty much make it clear here how God feels about certain moral beings. Of, of homosexual nature. So so Lot went out to them at the doorway and shut the door behind him. Correct. Okay. Now, this is important that he shut the door behind him because it said, please, my brothers, do not act wickedly. Right. Please, my brothers. Right. So that word for brothers yeah. means companion. It means somebody that you know. It means somebody who's close to you. You don't call somebody your brother unless you're close to them. So Lot isn't going like, I don't know who you guys are, but you better not touch the people inside here. He knows who they are. He knows that he doesn't just know who they are. He knows them. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, when, when you said he was in the gate, uh, we can read throughout scripture that he had a position of prominence mm-hmm. in the city. Mm-hmm. So he had... In true Eddie Haskell fashion, mm-hmm. <laughs> I like your analogy, mm-hmm. he had worked his way up, as it were. As it were, yeah. yeah. So now, behold, I have two daughters who have not had relations with man. Please let them bring them out, Let me bring them out to you, and you do to them whatever you like. Only nothing to see these men. Only do nothing to these men, sorry. Only do nothing to these men, inasmuch as they have come under the shelter of my roof. And, and go ahead, did you want to say something? Well, yeah, just as a quick point here, this, this shows you how much uh, uh, it was very important to bring strangers in and give them uh, 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 comfort and shelter in your house. That was a, a very high standard. But it also, as develops throughout this chapter, a lot is happening. And one of the things is it's also showing uh, Lode is far more concerned about his reputation than his own daughters. Than his own daughters, yeah, for sure. And then they said to him, the, the brothers, ha, ha, ha said to him, furthermore, stand aside. They said, stand aside. Uh, This one came in as an alien. He's talking about Lot here, right? Right. Lot, you came in as an alien, and he's already acting like some sort of judge. Now we will treat you worse than them. So they pressed hard against Lot. Right. They pressed hard against Lot and came near to break the door. So they're really aggressive, really after it. He might have been a brother a second ago, but now that he's denying them what they want, they're ready to take them down. Right. You know? Uh, uh, so so the men reached out their hands and brought the men in the house, the angels, reached out with their hands and brought Lot into the house with them, and then they shut the door quick. That's right. Yeah, so it, it seems like he's rescued again here. And you could say I give him, uh, I, I attribute to him righteousness, um, Sort of, but again, it's not it's it's not altruistic uh, mm-hmm. when we compare him to Abraham. In other words, he does have these strangers, and we can read extra uh, texts outside of the Bible that talk specifically about Sodom and how wicked and how vile they were to strangers, mm-hmm. and how that was written in their law that they are to treat strangers this way. So, on oh, the one hand, it. he was brave to take them in, and even though he said, "and get out of here first thing in the morning." Nonetheless, Jeff, we also see his character in that um, I am more concerned about being right socially with, I, I took care of people coming under my roof, than my own daughters. So he was influenced by that culture. I mean, uh, you know, whether we talk about that or not, uh, his daughters create a problem down the road, but uh, that that's for another discussion. But we can see here that, that uh, Lot was not altruistic like Abraham at all. So the so the <clears throat> excuse me the angels reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house. They said, "Shut the door," and then they struck the men outside the door with blindness. Right, and whether or not Lot knew that or not, we know that from reading the passage. That's an amazing thing. So right. that gives them supernatural powers, and that kind of proves that they're angels, right? Oh, so, uh, this what's in my head right now is right. What, was what Paul tells us about angels. Right. Some of exactly. us has entertained angels unawares. That's exactly right. Yeah. 
That's exactly yeah. what's going on. And, and, and which also should make you wonder, as a, as a believer in these documents, uh, they obviously then take human form, right? Yeah. Because you're unawares if yeah. you didn't even entertain them, they're human form. Yeah. And the fact that yeah. earlier on, which is also significant, yeah. presaging another uh, story with yeah. Moses when they leave the Exodus, Lot made them, one of the things he made them was unleavened bread. Mm-hmm. But these celestial supernatural beings as it were ate the bread they did they the ate. food they ate with so lots. we see right. that again That's and right. we, we, we it's necessary to point that out because there's lots of occurrences where these beings interact in uh, with humanity and they're very much doing human activities mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. even with ultimately yeshua jesus who is resurrected and comes back and he's he eats with his he, uh, eats. he makes yeah. a breakfast actually. right yeah. right so yeah. some people think you become this sort of uh, mm. ephemeral mm. mist of something or other mm. and and you no longer have human mm. capacity to do certain things mm-hmm. well here we're saying again and again and again and this specifically mm. they ate the food they ate the food yeah but then the the two men uh, said to Lot, who else is here but who else do you have here? Right. And, and a son-in-law and your sons and your daughters and whomever you have in the city, bring them out of the place. Okay? This, folks, this is going to get interesting because we're going to learn how, how come this is happening here in a second. It's pretty amazing. For we are about to destroy this place, Sodom and Gomorrah and the five cities on the plain, because their outcry has become so great before the Lord that the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Their outcry. Right. Their outcry. Right. And and again, if we hearken back and we keep uh, taking these uh, these verses, we juxtapose the verses, the Lord yeah. said, I will look and I will judge. I will know and I will see. And now these men are saying, we are about to destroy the city. We are about to do this. So when I, when I read that word outcry, the, mm-hmm. the, the passage that pops into my head is when Jesus talks about wailing and gnashing of teeth. Yeah. Weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth, and that's what you get with evil. Right? right. That's what. That's the destruction of evil right. against humanity. Is you get weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, and that's the outcry that the Lord is hearing. That there's damage being done to people, and and this and it's being it's being undertaken by these horrendous people in Sodom and Gomorrah and the five cities. Right. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-laws who were who to marry his daughters. And he tries to urge them to go, and they refuse. Yeah, it seems to me, uh, if you read this verse, and and certainly some of the commentary in the Hebrew, uh, he didn't say it with the same force and effect. He didn't say it to somebody who would say, I am going to force you if you don't come with me. They were laughing along with his joke at these two guys because, again, we don't know when he shut the door. We don't know that inside they knew they were blind or what was happening. We don't know. They could have or couldn't have. But his sons-in-law thought he was jesting. They mm-hmm. were laughing. Mm-hmm. Now, if he had the sort of uh, uh, intensity that they had to listen to him, yeah. at best they would have said, "Lot, we're, you know, un- you know, uh, uh, not uncle, but you know, <laughs> well, a father-in-law, dad, yeah, dad, father-in-law, daddy, dad, daddy, yeah. daddy, Lot, uh, daddy, daddy Lot. Lot yeah. Listen, uh, mm-hmm. you, you seem like you're very agitated. We're concerned about no, none of that. None they of laughed that. They with laughed. him. Yeah. So it seems from the verses that he is not taking it serious. And as we go on, we'll see just how unserious he well, does take it. I would offer an alternative to that. Perhaps he actually doesn't want them to come. Well, you know. You know if, what I mean? If, 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 he if, actually doesn't want these future sons and laws well, to come with well, him. Well, <laughs> well, okay, you know, <laughs> maybe so. I, we don't I, know. I don't want you guys with me. Whatever. We anyway. know that they thought he was joking with them. Yeah, they did. Yeah. So when morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Get up, take your wife, take your daughters who are here, and you will, or you will be swept away by the punishment. It's time to go. Let's go. So he, he urged Lot. So, but Lot hesitated, he so they grabbed him. Right. They seized him by his hand and the hand of his wife and the hands of his two daughters, and they pulled him out of the city, right? Because they had compassion, and the, Lord, the Lord's compassion was on them, and uh, they brought them out. And put them outside the city. And when they had brought them outside the city, uh, one said, Escape for your life. Do not look behind you. Do not stay anywhere in the valley. Escape to the mountains or you will be swept away. We're talking about fire and sulfur and 
sulfur on fire brimstone coming out of the sky. Well, we know that happened subsequently. We don't know that yet, but here, listen to the words of these men slash angels. Yeah. They are emphatic. Oh, yeah. They are deliberate. Drill sergeants. They are anxious. Yeah. They are serious. Yeah. Contrast that with Lot, who it says he lingered. Yeah, he, he hesitated. He hesitated. He he yeah. told his sons, and they were laughing. Uh-huh. So, who is this guy? Who is this guy? Yeah. So he said he said uh, he was hesitated before they said, "Run for your life," but then they did say, "Hey, run for your life." I'm not kidding. This is really going to happen. Let's go. And Lot said to them, "But no." He still argues. My lords. Still argues. Now behold, your servant has found favor in your sight. You know, you guys like me, don't you? Uh, and you have magnified your loving kindness, haven't you? And which have shown me by saving my life, didn't you? So I cannot escape to the mountains, for the disaster will overtake me and I will die. He really doesn't want to leave oh the my plane. Goodness. Yeah, you, he your doesn't perfect, want to leave. perfect uh, Eddie Haskell analogy <laughs> of, of so gracious. Oh, my Lord, you're so wonderful. But yeah. hey, I can't go. Yeah. I will happen. My life. What about me? And it's, he says, this town right here yeah. is near enough. Let's just go there. Yeah. Yeah. Let me escape there. Is it, isn't it too small? Is it too small? My, but my life, my life will be saved there, won't it? And they said to him, Behold, I grant you this request. Wow. Also, wow. to not overthrow that town which you have spoken about. So they're going to let that town live. But That's how much compassion God has on Lot. But think about this, too. That's exactly right, Jeff. He's, a, he's the Eddie Haskell. He's pulling his Eddie Haskell on yep. him still right yep. up to this yep. moment in yep. spite of all their anxiety. Yep. Behold, I grant this yeah. request. That's the Lord, right? Yeah, but yeah. he's granting the, the request? God, God is, and then he says, hurry and escape, therefore I cannot do anything until you arrive there. And the town was named Zoar. Zoar, yeah. Right. That's so great. the sun had risen over the earth when Lot came to Zoar, and he was safe there. And then the Lord rained down on Sodom and Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord, out of heaven, and he overthrew those two cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants. But Lot's wife was behind him, and she turned and looked back and became a pillar of salt. So the, the angels had, had warned them all, do not look back, do not turn back. And she did that, and she became a pillar of salt. They didn't say to her, if you look back, you will be turned. You will be turned into a pillar of salt. No, they didn't. So they didn't say that. So it wasn't like a thing that happened as a consequence. It just was something that happened, possibly because the rain, maybe the stuff rained down on her. I don't know what it is, but uh, she suffered a consequence of some sort. That's exactly right. And like all these Bible uh, stories that we've read, it's it's also a telling and indicative what it doesn't say. Mm. And so, as you pointed out, mm. it didn't tell. It told her not to, so she did suffer a consequence. Mm. But also, as we'll probably get into, there's other interpretations of that 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 maybe sound a little. Uh, strange to to the listeners, but this text did not say, or you will be turned to a pillar of no, salt. It didn't say that. No, no. It, so, did you want to say any more about that? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, it's it's just interesting here that Lot keeps arguing with these people in true Eddie Haskell fashion, and then he gets to Zohar, and then he's afraid once he gets to Zohar. So, mm-hmm. he he gets his wish, but it's sort of like God sometimes will give you your your demand, your request, but you are going to suffer the consequences. Now, in this case, we talked about, from the text, we can show that it's apparent that there probably was at least 10 people in Lot's family, of which Abraham bargained for. Mm. Okay, so Mm. now the thing is, they only left with the four. Right. They only left with the four, and and they're told, get out, go, go. go." And maybe at this point, uh, maybe the way it's starting to seem is maybe they're starting to see some some ominous clouds coming, some fearful, because all of a sudden they, they want to get to Zohar, but things are starting to occur. So maybe yeah. they saw some things. Here's the, the point. Mm-hmm. We, we, we read and draw a great number of conclusions by the fact that Lot's wife, yes. who's, who's unnamed in Scripture at least, yes. Yes. she became a pillar of salt. Yeah. Uh, but why, think about it, Lot had no problem, none, no compunction at all that we read of looking back at the destruction and the demise of his own children as well as his sons-in-law that were laughing with him about the whole event beforehand. Mm-hmm. Only the wife, and you know, again, I'll just tell you, other texts, mm-hmm. not in the Bible, but mm-hmm. other texts say 
She was driven by compassion for her family. Now, mm-hmm. just think about this. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine a mother leaving any of their children and saying, just walk away, get away now, go with your husband, and see all that destruction that's starting to come or mm-hmm. is coming? Mm-hmm. Leave them. Don't yeah. even look back or weep. And yeah. so you, yeah. you say it's a pillar yeah. of salt. Well, yeah. that, that's indicative of yeah. uh, maybe salty tears. Mm. That pillar can mm. also be called, uh, can be referenced as a monument. And, and we're always taught uh, in Bible class that uh, she turned back on it. She was being disobedient. Disobedient. She, she was being arrogant. Arrogant, right? right. But as you say, not if, not all ten came. No. It's possible that she was feeling compassion and she was feeling the pain of loss of the people that didn't make it out. Right. That were the, of the ten. That were of and her she, family. And she turned back just, just to, in the, out of an expression of longing, I hope they're okay, or I, I, you know, well, maybe she's praying for them. We don't know. We don't know, but just put yourself in that position and say, could I literally turn my back on, on the seat of my body mm-hmm. as a woman, mm-hmm. walk, run, whatever, mm-hmm. escape, while I hear what's happening behind me or see what's, what's, what's about to happen behind me, and there are my children, and I won't even look back. Yeah, so, yeah. That's but, really hard to do if you're a mom, I'll tell you. So now Abraham rose uh, early in the morning and went down to the place where he had stood with Yahweh. Right. And he looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the valley, and he saw, and behold, or look... Or holy cow, is another way of saying it, the smoke of the land ascended like smoke from a furnace. Thus it came about, when God destroyed the cities of the valley, that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he threw the cities in which Lot lived. So what do we know now that we didn't know before when the two angels went in? We know now that Abra- that God had it in his heart to honor Abraham's love for Lot, right? Mm. To honor Abraham's love for Lot, to, to uh, care so much for Abraham because of who Abraham is, because of who Abraham is and has been to him, that he sends two angels to rescue Lot and whoever will come out with them, and that's what happens. Yeah, exactly. It's a, it's the picture we keep trying to tell people that these are not just stories. They're also types and pictures to glean things from as to realities in the spirit and natural realm. And here you have Lot right up to the end arguing, fighting, resisting, lingering, bargaining for his own self when... As we pointed out, when Abraham heard the bad news about Lot, he reacted right away. Mm-hmm. He went and fought the, the, the kings of the of the east, mm-hmm. which is significant for our present day. But yeah. then in this verse we have here, Abraham gets up early in mm-hmm. the morning. Mm-hmm. He, he, he He's not just, well, I'll, I'll sleep in, I'm sure I'll hear about it. He's up early to check what happened to what happened to Lot, what happened to him. Mm-hmm. You know, so he's he's there. But here we have this picture of, in this verse... The whole reason these men, these angels, Mm. God himself came to Lot was nothing that Lot had done. It's showing us the pictures of of what he is. But he got imputed Mm -hmm. righteousness Mm -hmm. vicariously through a Messiah figure. Or or sympathetically. Sympathetically. Sympathetically through Abraham. Through Abraham. Call it however you want, but this is crucial to uh-huh. see the type yeah. not that Abraham was Messiah right. or that Abraham was was no. w- 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 was God but he, he they want us to compare and contrast yeah. what's going on because Absolutely. again Jeff we yeah. we have to point out that while this story talks most people are familiar with it for the uh, as we kid around God's weapons of mass destruction and yeah. Sodom and Gomorrah. The yeah. story is not about destruction. Yeah, it is about redemption. Redemption, absolutely, and a chance to have salvation. Yeah, absolutely, and a righteousness. Yeah. What that avails you, and as was Noah's story, exactly a deliverance story, a redemption story, a, redemption. a new covenant story, a new Correct. chance, a new opportunity. Right, uh, and and Abraham is the same, and we're seeing this idea of salvation and Messiah from the very beginning. We're not even out of Genesis yet. Right. We're not even out of Genesis yet. Right. And so so the God the Bible is a book of redemption, it's a book of salvation, it's a book of rescue. Correct. And and, and we're seeing these patterns emerge 
almost immediately in the text. And to the degree that God would go to bring salvation to undeserving people. That's what he wants you to see so that you don't, you know, sometimes we can also say, I'm so bad, I've done so much. What's No, I mean, you, you can barely do much worse than Lot does and did. <laughs> he, uh, I mean, he... But that's, this, again, is, is types, and, and not just a one-time event. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, as you pointed out at the beginning, Lot got rescued mm-hmm. by righteous Abraham mm-hmm. at great personal risk to Abraham. Yep. He didn't bargain about, what about no. me, my, like Lot did, and yep. what if it happens to me? He went and rescued him militarily. Fought and died. Fought uh, and people, di- people died. People died, yeah. and God rescued him again. Lot went right yep. back. Yeah. And, and now here again yeah. we have because of this righteous Messiah yeah. person. Abraham. He is a Messiah. Mm-hmm. He's not the Messiah. Right, 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 right. That's crucial to know. Yeah. He's yeah. not the Messiah. Yeah. He's a Messiah. Right. That God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst yeah. because of that. So these are the things we need to apprehend for our own And he did walk. the same thing with Noah. He did the same thing. No, How long did Noah work on that boat? 120 years or Correct. something? Ridiculous. Correct. But here's something I want us to grasp yeah. also. Okay, So we've noticed that uh, we're, we're going to end chapter 19 here. There's, a, there's another passage at the end here, but it doesn't help us understand Abraham anymore. It sure does help us understand Lot, though. So if you want to read that ending passage in, in uh, 19, uh, go right ahead and do that. But it just affirms what we already know about Lot. But anyway... Uh, so I, I want to talk about Abraham's steadfastness to Lot and what that says about his righteousness. Right. So righteousness and steadfastness, faithfulness and righteousness, how they go together. Abraham just would not quit on this guy. He was faithful, and he's faithful to God. Whatever God else asks of him, he goes and does it. He, he's, he's faithful to So his faithfulness, his steadfastness, and his righteousness are all mixed together in this guy, Abraham. And he becomes this guy once, you know, he starts to become this guy when God says go. Right. Right? That's exactly and right. He, and he's, he, he's starting to learn who he is, and God starts testing him. And we have the tests on Facebook. You can look at the tests. But, but uh, uh, there, there's many opportunities for Abraham to cast Lot aside and say, I'm done. Yeah, oh, yes, but exactly. He doesn't, but he does not do it. Lot's a new good, Nick, but Abraham sees gold. Mm-hmm. Boy, that's like a parent, isn't it? It is. It, I tell you, it really is. And, it is. and he bargained down for 10 because he assumed, I know that there's those 10 men and those 10 family members, and God will see those 10 and that righteousness. See, Abraham looked at people that way like Messiah does. He looked at them as righteous when they were sinners. Mm-hmm. And he saw in them goodness when they were no good. And that's what Abraham was doing here with Lot. He's seeing goodness. He's seeing gold. He's seeing something that probably will transpire in the future because we do have a reference by luxury of reading ahead that the New Testament says righteous Lot. Something obviously happened. And we have other characters in, in the Bible you and I have talked about, Jeff, that we don't know, but there's traditions that later after this event that's recorded where there are no good nicks like Lot, and that later in other traditions it says they, they repented and, and, and so on and so forth. Something happened to Lot somewhere because we're about to be done with Lot. But this is a perfect example of the juxtaposition of Messiah seeing gold in sinful man and redeeming them. So uh, I want to bring to our attention, this is something from the Old Testament, Genesis, the first book of the Bible, right, Uh, that, that we learn about in the New Testament. But we see it here with Abraham, okay? And I'm just going to read from the New Testament, and you tell me if Abraham wasn't this way to his nephew. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. Love does not brag. It is not arrogant. It does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own way. It is not provoked. It does not take into account the wrong uh, suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. Yeah. And it's... And, and it, it, the, the thing I want you guys to get, folks, listeners right now, is that this is in the Old Testament before it was written in the New. That's exactly We right. see it in action before Paul writes it down. That's exactly right. Paul may have gotten it from Abraham's story 
and discerned what the qualities of Abraham were and expressed those in the new. We'll never know. No. But it's amazing to me that we see the we see love in action, as Paul wrote it in First Corinthians. We see it in action in Genesis. That's that's great that you pointed that out because that's what we're hoping that the uh, listeners glean from this one: the steadfastness of God toward you, no matter what you've done or how many times you've gone back. And it's not to wink, wink, nod, nod. That's not it because there there is a you can get caught up and be a pillar of salt, as it were, even if you have the best of intentions. Uh, so things can happen, but your reference there is, people have pointed out, you know, we sometimes think as Christians at least, Gentile Christians, New Testament believers, that the Old Testament is of a harsh, hard, old God, and the New Testament's a loving, mm. soft, little baby figure. Mm. Mm. Well, the fact of the matter is, people have pointed out many times, there is more judgment and warning about judgment in the New Testament than the Old, (laughs) and there is more occasions of mercy and grace written about in the Old Testament than the New. (laughs) It's just to get people to rethink how we've looked at some of these characters and events. So, so this is kind of we're 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 not. I don't. I think we might do one more uh, one more show, uh, but maybe not. Neil and I, Neil and I, will discuss it. But I think we've made a good case here. If you go back and listen to these six through 13 now, 6 through 13, you'll see, you'll see that uh, we talk about who Abraham was, we talk about wh- how he behaved, we talk about what God did through Abraham, we talked about the covenant, the covenant of the land, we, I mean there's a lot, there's a lot going on here, I think maybe we got one more to go, but uh, we certainly have, in, uh, in, in my opinion, proven our case that Israel is important, because Abraham is the father of Israel. And that the land, the place of Israel, is incredibly important to God because he gives it to them forever. So I just want to make that point, uh, folks, and and, uh, just be thinking about that uh, because it is what we're trying to do with the show, Israel, why is the Middle East important? Uh, and so, so we'll we'll pick it up. Uh, we'll pick it up next time, and we'll and we'll see where we go with it. But uh, our our next stop uh, on on the five people we talk about in this uh, in this event is Moses. And we're going to get to Moses at some point, uh, but we'll see what we talk about next time. So uh, we look forward to forward you coming back. Uh, check us out on Facebook and uh, and uh, interact with us there. We love to we love to hear from you. This has been a great discussion for this episode of Israel. Why is the Middle East important? I look forward to how this continues to unfold. As you can tell, Neil and I enjoy talking about the subject as it helps us to get to the root of the matter about God and why Israel and the Middle East are so important. Thank you for listening to this podcast, and we would love to hear from you. Visit us at our home at Spreaker.com. Israel, why is the Middle East important? That's Spreaker.com. Israel, why is the Middle East important? And you can find us on Facebook using that same title. And you can email us at whyisthemiddleeastimportant at gmail.com. That's whyisthemiddleeastimportant at gmail.com. Love to hear from you. If you like what you hear, please invite your friends to the conversation. One thing Neil and I always say to each other is, I don't know, because the only way we know is to not know. Once you have it all figured out, you stop learning. And that state of mind is what helps us to learn and grow. We invite you into that journey with us. From Neil Johnson and me, Jeff Pelletier, Shalom, and see you next time.
Shalom.